welcome to this special interview with The Wire. With me today is historian Sudev Shet, who teaches history at the University of Pennsylvania. And he's written this new book, Bank Rolling Empire, Family Fortunes and Political Transformations in Mughal India. Thank you so much for joining me today, Sudev. Thank you for having me. Uh, this book looks at a business family in Gujarat who were involved in political financing and traces their trajectory during Mughal rule and after and looks at how they were affected by different changing political dynamics and also how they responded to these. I wanted to start by asking you, the major family you focus on is the Javeri family in Gujarat. Uh, what exactly did they do? Because the role you lay out for them in professionally is quite complex. They're jewelers, they deal in gems and jewels, but they're also some sort of medieval bankers. They give loans, they do currency exchange. And uh, in the later years, once the Mughal Empire is not doing so well, they also do some sort of work of what we would maybe today describe as political fixers. So could you speak a little about what they did? Yes. The Javeri family is one of probably many families that existed across India during the Mughal period. Unfortunately, we don't have as robust evidence as we would like for many other families. Uh, so in some sense, the Javeri family is one of the few that we can actually write about in any systematic, robust sense. The Javeri family that I focus on uh, originally comes from Rajasthan, and they migrate to Ahmedabad sometime in the late 16th century, around maybe the 1550s, 1560s. And uh, they initially start out as jewelers. They end up, uh, you know, sort of buying and selling gems. And over time, they develop a kind of expertise in, in actually identifying rare beautiful gems. Some are coming from within the subcontinent, and in many cases, they're coming from abroad. So, uh, you know, those who had the skill to figure out which gems were worth a lot uh, and which cuts were prized, uh, over time sort of became favorites of elites of the society. So the Javeris got their start as, as jewelers, but in some senses, jewelry is just one part of their portfolio. Over time, uh, they also entered the world of money exchange, so converting coins and bullion, for example, silver and gold bars, into coins that can actually be used in the market. They also facilitated cargo exchange, including the financing of commodities such as indigo, saltpeter, and even manufactured textiles. And it is only over time that they actually entered the world of political financing, or what you had called political fixing. Um, the point to emphasize here is that, like any good business family or any good business group, a diversity of activities in one's portfolio allowed them to stay robust and allowed them to kind of um, survive over time. So, yes, their portfolio became complex over time, but initially they started out as jewelers. That was their specialization and that was their expertise. Javeri, in fact, means uh, one who uh, engages in the business of jewelry, buying and selling of jewels. Right. Uh, you mentioned in your book that it's not common to come across the kind of documents you found about these, this family. So how unique would a family of this kind have been in that time? Yes, uh, you know, what's quite interesting for our purposes is, um, especially as historians, we like to think that everything we are looking at is exceptional or very unique. But I won't right. go as far as saying that this family was entirely unique. We know for sure that other cities across Gujarat and even the subcontinent for that matter had uh, you know, long-standing prominent business families. Surat, for example, had a business family by the name of Virji Vora and they were involved in the opium and cotton trade. And further east in Bengal, we had the family of the Jagat State, for example. So we know that uh, prominent families existed, but yes, in Gujarat, in Ahmedabad in particular, this family was quite unique because the evidence that we have, which ranges from English factory records, Dutch shipping records, Persian and Gujarati and Sanskrit texts, all suggest that the Javeris were very prominent. And many of the other smaller bankers, in fact, followed the lead of the Javeri family, you know, both in terms of money, in terms of something mm -hmm. as concrete as lead lending, which is when one banker kind of collects loans from many smaller bankers and packages it into one large loan. So the Javeris were leaders of that system, but also socially and culturally, because the Javeris were prominent Jains in the community. And many other smaller bankers looked to them for cues on how to behave socially and culturally. So, you know, mm -hmm. it's a, a bit of both. In some sense, they were very unique, 
in the case of Ahmedabad city itself. But if you look at the subcontinent uh, as a larger space, there were other families like the Javedis across many of the cities who were prominent merchants of the towns that they came from. Right. Uh, Ahmedabad was an important trading capital even before the Mughals took over this Gujarat region. So were the roles of the local business elites like the Javedis very different before and during Mughal rule? That's also a very good question. Let me say something a bit about the evidence uh, prior mm -hmm. to kind of commenting on this yeah. question. Um, we know a lot about European business families that are prominent. I'll give you an example. The Medici family of Italy, the Rothschilds of England and France. We also have the Fugers of Germany and many others. And we actually have archives from these families that go back 500 or 600 years. In fact, at my own university, we have account books from medieval Italy that the Medici family used to kind of fill out and, and they used to conduct their business. In the case of South Asia, um, both environmental factors, because the environment is not conducive to preserving uh, textual documentation, and also indigenous documentary practices were not similar necessarily to those of Europe. So both mm -hmm. environmental factors, but also cultural practices of documenting activities are very different in these two societies. So it's very difficult overall to kind of trace and pinpoint historical change or activities of these folks over a long period of time. So yeah. when you ask me about what the role of merchants and bankers were prior to Mughal period, uh, we have limited evidence for that. Despite mm -hmm. that, despite that, we have wonderful histories written by many scholars, including people like Samira Sheikh, who teaches at Vanderbilt University, and earlier scholars like VK Jain, who have focused on this very question. I'll tell you what we've learned so far. We know that Gujarat's coastline stretches over a thousand miles and maritime networks have connected mercantile communities across the Indian Ocean for over a millennium. So something like, you know, a thousand years of trade happening through Indian Ocean and through the ports of Gujarat have been documented in some fashion. But what is unique for our purposes is that only after about 1200 do we start seeing politics and mercantile networks kind of coming together in a kind of double helix. You know, if you think about a DNA model, we think about this kind of intertwined double helix. And if I think of those uh, analogies, I feel that it describes the relationship between merchants and politicians or political leaders very well. That only after around 1200, with the expansion of agrarian frontiers, um, that we start actually seeing these two coming uh, into conversation with, we, with each other in a very robust way. We know that water structures, rest houses, temples, and many other architectural marvels were usually built by wealthy merchants and courtiers, mm -hmm. not necessarily sultans. What's unique about the Mughal period, especially when Akbar, uh, you know, kind of engages in conquest and incorporates Gujarat into his empire, it is for the first time that we actually have Gujarat being part of a larger pan-Indian political organization. So Gujarat becomes one province mm -hmm. among many other provinces. And this is very significant because the administration of Gujarat then becomes subject to empire-wide logistics and empire-wide considerations. We have governors coming to Gujarat who come for two years or three years uh, maximum and then they're rotated to other provinces. So mm -hmm. this is a very, very important shift in um, social and political life. And this opens up, as I argue in the book, new opportunities for merchants to kind of ingratiate themselves or become closer to political elites as this relationship becomes one of um, increasing complexity and increasing interdependence. So yes, in short, we know merchants existed prior to Mughal rule, and they were very much important and involved in trade. But I suggest and I argue that it is really with the coming of the Mughal Empire that merchants start seeing the political landscape as one of opportunity for them and also mm -hmm. one of potential danger too, right? Because yeah. you are now starting to be a member of the court. You're spending time with governors and princes and emperors. And that relationship is one that I like to trace over the book over two, three hundred years. That actually leads right into where I wanted to go next, which is specifically to the Javeri family and their relationship with the Mughal court over several generations. And your book traces this and you demarcate four stages that you name. 
and this relationship starts out in a kind of mutually beneficial but quite simple way uh, and then that changes as the mughal empire becomes less financially secure and becomes more reliant on loans uh, and in fact as you said it it does bring with it some dangers as well for the family so could you take us through those stages yes so before i uh, explain to you each of those four stages i'd like to mention that as historians or as scholars of human behavior both past and present our goal is to try and in some sense bring logic or discern some kind of mm -hmm. pattern in human behavior and there's always inherent risk in doing this we you know in trying to kind of categorize or uh, come up with typologies or frameworks we often end up oversimplifying so while i have charted four phases of relationship between political power and capital or the javeri family itself i just want viewers to be aware that obviously this is not a perfect frame and that yeah. you know uh, human behavior is a lot more complex than that that being said, we're trying to discern patterns and make broader arguments. And I found that, um, you know, ideas from community ecology, you know, in terms of thinking about relationships from the biological world, uh, help to explain the Javeri family and their role uh, in the Mughal Empire and the, and the post-Mughal Empire. So the four phases, I'll lay them out for you and I'll explain them very briefly. Uh, there are four phases and they kind of, over time, shift and, and map these power capital relations. The first is what I call courtly mutualism. And that is uh, really from the late 16th century up until about 1658. The second phase is what I call political commensalism. And that goes until about the early 18th century uh, with the death of Aurangzeb in 1707. Uh, the third phase is expedient extortion which um, moves us into about the mid 1730s or so and the final phase which is a kind of resolution is what i'm calling competitive co-parsonary which really describes political capital relations post 1730. so let me say a bit about each of these right courtly mutualism is simply the idea that as emperor akbar and his successors you know especially jahangir and shah jahan built a mughal empire that was court focused merchants politicians and anyone who was seeking upward mobility and even employment in the mughal empire had to sort of make their way to court and ask for audience with the emperor and courtly behavior which many other scholars have documented was a very important part of building these relationships right how you behave at court what kind of gifts you bring to court what kind of conversation you have at court with the emperor and the courtiers present there was a very, very important part of achieving political favor and achieving kind of social benefits that you were you know, essentially hoping for. So what I say in this book is that the Javeris identified courtly mutualism uh, as a strategy for building uh, very robust and very positive relations with people in power. And this courtly mutualism was uh, bi-directional. So it wasn't just the merchants trying to ingratiate themselves with emperors. It was also emperors and princes and governors realizing that these merchants were um, not just useful in obtaining luxuries and commodities from Indian Ocean ports, but in some senses, they could use these merchants as representatives of Mughal power in the locality. So for example, if Shantidas Javeri, the patriarch that's featured in this phase, um, has positive relations with the Mughal court, it is more likely that he would go back to his locality in Ahmedabad and uh, speak highly of the court, speak highly of the emperor, and get other local merchants to kind of support imperial rule mm -hmm. in the locality. So that's the first phase. It's courtly mutualism. Again, it's not strict mutualism because at the end of the day, the Mughal state was more powerful than any merchant. Mm -hmm but this is kind of a loose mapping. The second phase, political commensalism, is a very interesting one because it corresponds to a uh, political change that was happening in the Mughal Empire itself. And this is really Aurangzeb's violent bid for the throne, you know, the, the, the violent bid to becoming emperor, which was during the final years of Shah Jahan's rule. And 
political commensalism really refers to this earlier mutualism giving way to the Mughals identifying Javeri resources for use during moments of exceptional need, and especially succession wars between rival brothers for the throne. So I situate this new phase as a feature of mid-17th century Mughal capital relations because we actually have direct evidence of the Javeri's family's financial contributions to political campaigns of the era. And other leading historians of Mughal India have also noted this, most notably Munis Faruqi, uh, who teaches at UC Berkeley, has a wonderful book called Princes of the Mughal Empire, where he documents the need for increased capital for princely mm -hmm. tournaments for the throne in a very systematic fashion. So this phase, political commensalism, is one in which the Javeris neither benefit in very explicit manner, neither are they uh, sort of losing out in any systematic way. Mm -hmm. It's sort of a political opportune moment for hedging political futures, for hedging bets. Contemporary analogies might be something like a prominent business family funding two sides of a political campaign or two parties just to ensure that whoever comes into power, um, you know, they have still some kind of favorable relation or some kind of political right. cloud because of that. Yeah. backing. So the Javeris were engaging in this kind of political enterprise. And I believe this was new. This was a new feature of South Asian political life uh, in the mid 17th century. The third phase, which I uh, uh, describe, is what I call expedient extortion. And this mm -hmm. is really a shift, a massive shift, by the early 18th century. And, I, and this, I believe, is really the hallmark or the crux of my book, which is to say that as the Mughal Empire was already facing uh, increased financial demands and increased administrative demands, largely because it was trying to expand much faster than it could pay for, they had to identify new sources of wealth and new sources of capital to be able to sustain a large political enterprise. And Javeri wealth and merchant wealth became key targets for local governors and even uh, princes and emperors. Initially, mm -hmm. political elites asked very politely for this wealth. And in some cases, this wealth was provided with the hope mm -hmm. that it would be paid back with additional wealth and political favors. But when times became very desperate, we see the violent extortion of local merchants in Gujarat, for example, in Surat, for example, in Cambay also, which is a port city in Gujarat, for increased amounts of money. And this is really where business found amazing, amazing challenges, especially for personal security and, and personal well-being, but also new opportunities to gain in entrepreneurial ways. And this is really what uh, is new in the early 18th century. Over time, I come to the fourth phase, which is what I'm calling competitive co-parsonary, which is simply the idea that many bankers and merchants got together. And as the Mughal Empire was sort of on its way out, realized that there were new political and financial tools needed to be able to broker political deals. Right. Mm -hmm. And so competitive co-parsonary is a kind of culmination of these phases where multiple political aspirants decided that contractual obligations between each other, promises of pay in the future, et cetera, would be the, the right, perhaps, and, and most efficient way of organizing multiple claims to political sovereignty. And this is really where you get the birth of princely states, right? People think about who were these Maharajas and these local princes who were friends of the British, they were largely pensioners of late Mughal governors in many mm -hmm. cases before actually becoming uh, pensioners of the East India Company. And the East India Company realized that competitive co-parsonary was their strategy to enter Indian political economy and in some cases dominate the subcontinent without actually having to unleash as much violence as one would expect. So it was really yeah. financial diplomacy that became the hallmark of um, you know, late 18th, early 19th century political life. And my story kind of traces the development of this over time. Uh, you mentioned right now the, uh, the part about Aurangzeb's bid for power once Shah Jahan was unwell. And I found a part of that very interesting, which was that the Javeri family was in fact financially supporting Aurangzeb's youngest brother uh, in his bid for the throne. Yes. But even then, when Aurangzeb finally took over, he agreed to repay the loans that his brother had taken. 
And yes. they also had a slightly tumultuous history, Aurangzeb and the family, because uh, earlier on he had demolished a temple and then Shah Jahan had intervened um, yes. on that count. So what explains Aurangzeb's conciliatory attitude of agreeing to repay this loan, even though they had done it in support of his brother? Yes. Um, were there some local factors at play that made him want to keep them happy? Yes, very good question. Um, you know, much like our own times, uh, personal relations, professional relations are never on solid footing. And any given day, a friend could potentially become an enemy and vice versa. And even such strict categories as friends and enemies are very porous and very difficult to actually pinpoint precisely, right? Mm -hmm. If you think about our own personal lives also. Much like that, um, in the 17th century, the Javeri family was no doubt a prominent family of Ahmedabad. And we actually have a lot of evidence for many governors who would come in and really be friendly with the Javeris in exchange for capital, in exchange for resources, in exchange for the right to purchase the best gifts coming through the ports from Europe and other places of the world. Now, Aurangzeb was a young prince, keep in mind. He was not a full-fledged adult emperor when he first okay. became governor of Gujarat, and this is in 1645. Um, he was in the province for less than two years, and he arrived with his retinue uh, into the city. And soon after, he desecrated uh, a Jain Derasar, which is called the Chintamani Parshwanath Derasar. I use the word temple in the book because it's much easier to digest that. But really, mm -hmm. in fact, it was a Jain Derasar or a Jain place mm -hmm. of worship. And this was built some two decades prior in 1625 by Shanti Das Javeri at a fairly large cost. So the, the Derasar existed for about two decades before Aurangzeb came in and desecrated it. Now, it's interesting that Shah Jahan was very upset at Aurangzeb doing this. And when mm -hmm. he heard about the desecration, quickly restored the temple land back to Shanti Das Javeri and his family. And in some senses, even apologized for the incident. Of course, uh, once the temple was desecrated, it was futile for them to rebuild it. What's interesting for our purposes is that we can only surmise why Prince Aurangzeb, in his capacity as provincial governor, decided to publicly raise a prominent banker's temple to the ground. Existing explanations that place known instances of temple desecration by rulers, especially of the Islamic period, uh, often see it as a strategy uh, for statecraft, or they see it as something like the prince's strict iconoclasm, you know, someone being a religious bigot or overzealous. I prefer to see this in a slightly different manner, that it is quite possible that he was bigoted in that way. But this explanation is less convincing for me because we actually have a lot of local literature that many other scholars have written about portraying Aurangzeb actually a devotee of Hindu gods and goddesses. And as a patron of some of the local saints uh, that belong to non-Islamic traditions. We unfortunately lack direct evidence uh, about the case of Chintamani being desecrated. But it is quite possible, and this is where my eye as a historian kind of focuses, that mm. Aurangzeb and Shantidas likely had a dispute regarding terms of trade. Other texts during this period, especially the Mirate Ahmadi, which is a very well-known Persian uh, documentary history has noted in passing that in the early months of Prince Aurangzeb's governorship in Gujarat, when he became governor, mm -hmm. expenses in the provincial capital actually outweighed any income that was coming in. And this mm -hmm. lack of income was actually reported to Shah Jahan's court at Delhi as well. And it is quite possible that this served as one basis for the prince's actions. We also know uh, that the Javeri family was much closer to Murad Baksh, which is Aurangzeb's brother, who served as governor some years later. And again, in trying to hedge their bets, they placed their bets on a losing prince. They couldn't have known that Murad was going to lose. It was yeah. a gamble that they took. Yeah. Yet, despite this, despite uh, them picking the wrong prince, Aurangzeb, when he becomes emperor uh, a little over a decade later, has matured in some senses and recognizes that it's much more politically uh, expedient and much more politically um, 
uh, sort of uh, necessary to maintain good relations with prominent princes, uh, sorry, prominent merchants in, in the locality. Mm -hmm. So again, to kind of build his emperor-wide network and to maintain positive relations with elites of Gujarat in the province, he decided to not only, of course, restore the land which his father had already initially done, but also decided to repay the loans that were given to mm -hmm. Murad Baksh, even though um, that loan didn't benefit Aurangzeb in any way. It was a political mm -hmm. recognition. It was a recognition of Shantidas's stature. And yeah. in some senses, Shantidas also appreciated this and went back mm -hmm. to the locality with the Farman from Aurangzeb saying, you know, well, Aurangzeb is our new emperor and we can continue and conduct our business in the way that we have been always doing. Right. Right. And what is, what is really key for our purposes here is that, you know, both merchants and elite political figures were always hedging their bets in any one direction. And in yeah. some cases, those were bad bets placed. But mm. the, the political sophistication of the time was that despite that, they had to kind of keep business moving. They had to keep politics moving. And what better way to do this than reconcile differences as best as they possibly could. This does not mean that Shantidas and Aurangzeb became friends. Or it does mm. not mean that merchants and political elites were friendly in any genuine manner, right? This was, in some senses, a kind of theater. It was a kind of um, a kind of song and dance, and one was yes. always trying to maximize their position in any way possible. So yes. that's sort of the incident there. And I think for our readers and for our viewers, it's very important to note that any kind of um, past historical injustice that we may see as being motivated by a single factor must be tempered by other explanations, must be tempered by other points of view. We can't just right. see the desecration of one temple as something like religious bigotry on total. Mm -hmm. There must be other factors to explain such a public raising of uh, an iconic yeah. site, right? And, and so I hope that readers actually see that um, in addition to the fact that politicians are always looking for creative ways to finance their campaigns and finance their being. We have some of this, in fact, in our own times now, as as as, as viewers yeah. would definitely know. Uh, so I, I think, I, just from what you just said, it's pretty clear what the rulers were getting from this relationship, especially later on, it was, it was money for their various campaigns, um, more and more of it as, as the time went on. Uh, but specifically, what sorts of quid pro quo and were involved in, in them receiving this money. Uh, of course, there was social and cultural importance be, for, from being associated with the court, from being seen as close to the court. Yes. But what were the business interests that were being served? Yes, that's a very, very good question. So ultimately, in a very concrete manner, local merchants of any stature, especially with the coming of Mughal rule, needed approval and needed the support of provincial governors and their uh, entourage to be able to actually physically enact trade, to be able to move commodities, money, and goods across Mughal roads. They aspired for increased security, which they needed from governors. We have instances where cargo is being usurped and Mughal governors are actually uh, providing some kind of rectification to the situation. Um, elites like Shantidas Chaveri needed wealthy and powerful princes to be able to purchase the commodities that they were obtaining from abroad. It's not good enough to get a rare shining ruby. Mm -hmm. You must actually have someone willing to purchase that as well, right? So they needed yeah. consumers for their goods. So that that was a sort of a concrete uh, 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 element that they, that they had to kind of agree on. From the ruler's perspective, they also needed merchants because Rulers were in the business of politics. They were in the business of administration. And they left many aspects of the market to merchants. One concrete example I can give you is money changing. When bullion, silver and gold bars were coming from abroad, many rulers relied on local mint masters and local merchants to actually convert those coins into 
to, to convert that raw uh, uh, silver and gold into usable coins. So the rulers also relied on merchants for kind of economic services, for financial exchange, for drafting hundis, which are essentially a kind of financial instrument that allows people to move money from one city to the other without actually having to carry vast amounts of gold. It's almost mm -hmm. like a modern day check. So, yeah. so these rulers and these merchants kind of needed each other for these services. Um, and uh, it was kind of mutual in that res respect. However, I do want to emphasize that it is very tempting to see any kind of historical interaction with some kind of single determinism, right? Oh, it was economic gain. It was financial gain. It was social gain. It was religious proclivity. It was community driven. I mm -hmm. think that we should take a step back and refrain from such kind of single deterministic factor. My approach to social science inquiry and human history is really that people's motivations are complex and they change within a single lifetime and within single interactions even. And they're truly dependent on environmental factors. So from that perspective, truth actually changes over time. I have had a lot of help with evidence and the benefit of hindsight, of course, also mm -hmm. to paint a picture of changing relations between power and money. But I have emphasized across the pages of Bankrolling Empire that at any given point, the motivations could have been very, very different. So, for example, we have to account for the fact that Aurangzeb may have actually changed his tactics uh, when actually becoming an emperor and kind of moderating his approach to political life uh, when compared to his younger days as a prince. Or mm -hmm. that Kushal Chanjaviri, the grandson of uh, the great grandson of Shantidas Javeri, who's featured in my book, he is known to have funded rival governors who were fighting for Gujarat at the same time. And in some mm -hmm. cases, the evidence suggests that he actually helped them with the ransacking and looting of Ahmedabad. It's quite possible that he was actually involved in that as well. Mm -hmm. Much like other evidence points to him actually warding off these governors and paying them off and having them leave the city. So it is quite possible that he was involved in both activities. And we have to kind mm -hmm. of see this uh, uh, with a little bit of complexity. What we do know for sure, though, in the pages of Bankrolling Empire, that being close to sources of political power is always about social prestige. And even now, descendants of the family speak about how their ancestors were close to emperors and close to princes. In some cases, they even used uh, terms of you know, affinity and kinship, right? In some cases, Shantidas was called Mama by members mm -hmm. of, of the, the Mughal household. Now, how accurate this is, TBD, right? But the point is that yeah. we have some oral histories that point to this, and they are very suggestive of the kind of relationships that descendants want to remember of their ancestors yeah. and those who are in political power. The truth is that political acumen and political shrewdness for business elites is often just good business. They go yeah. hand in hand, and this is no different in our own times today. Absolutely. And I think that complexity you were mentioning really comes out very starkly towards the end of your book, when you are talking about uh, members of these families switching allegiance really quickly or not really having allegiance in that way, yes. uh, in the same way as maybe the earlier generations did. Yes. Uh, thank you so much, Sudev, for joining me for this conversation. And I would encourage uh, all of our viewers to go and check out your book. Uh, it's a fascinating read. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, any of your viewers who want to share feedback, I'm most welcome and open to all points of view. So please do write into The Wire and share your thoughts. The Wire ke aur videos dekhne ke liye subscribe kare aur bell icon par click kare. Swatantra Patrakarita ki aardhik madad karne ke liye description mein diye gaye link par jaye aur apni rashi chunen.